So again, hello and welcome to the second of three webinars of the 2023-24 BCRC webinar series. Today we'll be focused on raising heifers for reproductive success, how to get heifers started on the right hoof to become good cows. I'm Sydney Fortier, a research and innovation coordinator for the BCRC, and I'll be your moderator this evening. Um, we are very excited to be able to put on these webinars for free through the Knowledge Dissemination and Technology Transfer Project funded by Canadian Beef Cattle Checkoff and Canada's Beef Science Cluster. We ask that if any questions come up that you submit them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, it should look something like that. Um, yeah, and then these questions will be addressed live at our Q&A session after both of our presenters have presented. We ask that you do not use the chat function to ask questions. Um, it just becomes a little bit more disorganized, um, but feel free to participate in conversations in the chat if you wish. This webinar is being recorded and we will be sending out the recording to all those who have registered, not just those who have attended live in about two to three business days following this live webinar. Uh, but you can find recordings of all our past webinars and other great videos on our website, beefresearch.ca or YouTube channel. And be sure to, to subscribe to either of those when you are there. This webinar is also available for CE credits for vets and vet techs across Canada. If you have identified yourself as one of those um, as you registered for the webinar, then you should receive your certificate via email in the next few days. Um, we now have multiple webinars available retroactively for CE credits, so you just have to watch the recording um, and then take the associated quiz, get 80% or higher, and um, then you would receive your, um, your certificate through that means. Um, if you have any questions or have not received your certificate within a week of the live webinar or upon completion of the quiz, please reach out to myself or to Dana Parker and we will get you all sorted. On our website, beefresearch.ca, we also have multiple interactive tools and calculators to help make informed decisions um, using your on-farm records easy. So this includes our replacement heifer calculator, which is a tool that was developed to help beef cattle producers estimate the total costs of developing a replacement heifer from weaning, through breeding, to preg checking, using your on-farm data. So it outputs a break-even price per head and a beautiful pie chart to show exactly what is driving the cost of raising these heifers. Um, and there's more information on this calculator in this post that is featured from September 13th, or you can reach out to myself or any staff of the BCRC to have any help if you're having any issues with the calculator or would like any more information. But without further ado, we have two very exciting speakers for you this evening who are rearing to share their thoughts and answer your questions. Um, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Homorowski, and invite her to share her screen. And then we will hear from Stephen a little bit later on. So with that, I will stop sharing and invite Elizabeth to share hers. So Dr. Elizabeth Homorowski was born and raised on a commercial cow-calf operation in Southern Ohio. Her interest in beef production led her to Ohio State University, where she completed a bachelor's of science degree in agriculture in 2008 and a doctoral degree in veterinary medicine in 2012. In 2013, she moved to Canada and began graduate school at the University of Calgary. There, she completed a master's degree in a clinical residency, becoming board certified in beef cattle practice through the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners. Dr. Homorowski joined Veterinary AgriHealth Services, a cow-calf and feedlot consulting practice near Adrie, Alberta in 2016, and has been a partner since 2019. In 2021, she was honored to receive the American Association of Bovine Practitioners James A. Jarrett Award for Young Leaders. Dr. Homorowski is also the co-operator of Blue Rose Semmentals and raises purebred Semmental and commercial Sim Angus cattle near Cremona, Alberta. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Homorowski. Uh, thanks very much, Sydney. Um, thank you as well to BCRC for continuing to do these programs. So um, everything okay with the slide set there? Can yeah, see looks it? great. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited to talk to you about, you know, uh, heifer development uh, and management tonight. This is one of my favorite areas that we work with uh, for our consulting clients, just because 
whether they're your heifers or purchase or their home raise, they represent a very large investment on your ranch. And so one of the most important things to understand is the cow value curve. So we all know that uh, feed costs often represent our, our log largest cost on most livestock operations. But the number two slot usually goes to depreciation. And so this um, uh, University of Missouri uh, Extension Service did a really nice job of um, visualizing how depreciation um, can affect your overall profitability. So when we look at this in terms of um, the value of an of a open heifer, a bred heifer, and then our young cows, middle-aged cows, aged cows, compared to their salvage costs as an open, um, that, that cow coming up open before she pays for herself uh, contribute to those overall depreciation costs. So some of the places that we can really implement some strategy um, in this area here, taking that weaned heifer calf to a bred heifer. So we're gonna focus a lot on that tonight. Um, I work with a few ranches and, and some of my colleagues will often market uh, middle-aged cows uh, around this time point here before their value starts to depreciate even as a bred cow. Um, trying to capitalize more on their value at that point. Or um, in, in lots of herds, we focus quite heavily on lo longevity. So for me, I would love to see um, this um, access down here go off the screen. It just warms my heart when a, when a 15, 14, 15, 16 year old cow comes through the chute and she's pregnant. I mean, you think about uh, the, the value that she's brought to your operation and how she's affected your profitability. Um, th those are, those are pretty cool cows. And so we're going to focus a lot on tonight on, on how you can extend this curve out even further. So we're going to, uh, primarily focus on what you can do today, um, all the way until the bulls get turned out. So there, there's a lot of, um, different philosophies on, how to select heifers and things you might look for at birth or weaning. Um, but I wanted to just more focus on what can you do from now on out. And so this is one of my favorite areas of research. And when I was, you know, a young 4-H'er and accompanying my dad to um, different producer meetings, they were telling us we should develop our heifers to say, uh, you know, 70, 75, even 80% of mature body weight by the time of breeding. Um, and we now know that <laughs> that probably wasn't, wasn't good for that heifer pushing her that far. Um, but she looked quite lovely, right? Um, she looked like a fat butterball turkey out there waddling around and, and she was quite nice to look at, but financially was not very good for our checkbook. And then when I was doing um, uh, my undergraduate uh, in animal science, a lot of research came out and said, you know, actually you can develop those heifers to 60 to 65 percent of mature body weight at the time of breeding and do just fine. And now you look at research both out of the U.S. and Canada, and it will consistently tell you you can develop heifers to only 50 to 55 percent of mature body weight without uh, negatively impacting health, without increasing dystocia rates, um, and it's very very economical to do that. But when and how? those heifers get to 55% is really important. And so I want to share some research with you out of the University of Nebraska. And they evaluated heifers in different development systems. So the first one here, this gray line, is called the early gain group. And so this would be very similar to how my dad and I developed heifers when I was a kid. They went into a dry lot. We, you know, brought them buckets of grain every day, uh, the feed went to them, and they pretty much only had to maintain body weight um, until they went out with the bull. Uh, the even gain group uh, in this burgundy line here, this would be a, a system where you're probably still actively feeding heifers, but maybe restricting gains a little bit, and uh, just having a very consistent weight gain all the way out to the time that the um, a bull goes out, contrast that with a late gain system. Uh, this would be most similar to a backgrounder operation where we are drastically reducing intakes 
we are targeting low but very efficient gains, like probably around that pound and a half area. And then we are taking advantage of compensatory gain, uh, compensatory gain in the spring once those heifers hit grass to bring us up to that 55%. And so these researchers wanted to understand what do these development systems, how do, how do they impact things like fertility and longevity. So here's some data from those studies where they looked at conception rates in heifers developed using the even gain versus the late gain system. They were, both groups were exposed to a bull for two cycles, uh, 42 days, and conception rates were very similar, 85% in both groups. But when those heifers started dropping calves the following spring and they could categorize um, them based on if they were first or second cycle pregnancies, turns out the late gain group had a huge advantage. So they had 15% more first cycle pregnancies than that even gain group. So better momentum, um, a more front end loaded calving season in these late gain groups. But not only that, when they went back and they crunched the numbers on the feed bills for these two um, development groups, turns out the late gain group consumed about 12% less feed. So if I could virtually give everyone a coupon tonight um, for 12% off of your winter feeding costs, I mean, that's something we would all jump at. So solid win here for late gain developed heifers. When they looked at those three groups um, in terms of longevity, again, the late gain heifers um, won the battle there. So this is each of those groups, depending on the percent that are remaining in the herd at two, three, four, and five years of age. You can see here that statistically, if you were developed in the late gain system, you were less likely to come up open and you stayed in the herd longer. So we often call these late gain um, development strategies like an extensive system, a rough it system. Um, basically what we're doing is we're treating her more like a cow. And the more you treat her like a cow, the better cow she's going to be. The worst thing we could do would be what my dad and I did <laughs> when I was little, which was um, pour the feed to them, pamper them, subsidize the inefficient ones so much that they still became pregnant in the spring. But because they're just inherently not that fertile or not that efficient, they come up open as a lactating two-year-old. And that's where depreciation costs can really creep up on you. So the great thing about these extensive systems is we're challenging them early. Mother Nature is helping us select who's the most efficient and who's the most fertile. The other thing I think that's happening is we're selecting or we're developing better grazing habits in those heifers. And so um, if you're using an extensive system, you're probably got those heifers out on some um, like stockpiled uh, forage. Maybe they're grazing some swath grazing. Um, but they're probably going to the feed as opposed to the feed coming to them. And that can make a huge difference. And in fact, at our operation, we really like to see those heifers um, graze through their first snowstorm alongside their mothers, because I truly believe them watching their mothers graze underneath that snow will be um, quite valuable to them down the road in terms of how they face the winter. Like the last thing I want is a group of cows standing in the corner, just staring over the fence, waiting for the tractor or the feed truck to arrive, right? They need to go out and, and be, uh, be working all winter for us. Uh, the other reason these extensive systems work, which we've already alluded to, is we're taking advantage of that compensatory gain. Right, so it is far better to have a slightly thin heifer that's gaining weight as opposed to a slightly overconditioned heifer losing weight. And so biologically what's going on in that thinner heifer, um, her, her body's saying, you know what, we, we went through some rough times, but things are looking pretty good right now. So might be a good idea to go ahead and start cycling and so we can secure the future of our species, right? Whereas that heifer that's carrying maybe a little extra condition and either, you know, 
ma just maintaining weight or losing weight going into breeding season. So this example of this would be maybe a heifer that was developed um, custom fed in a feedlot and then lost a little bit of condition when she hit grass. Biologically, her body's telling her, it looks like we're going into drought. You need to stop cycling because you just need to take care of you right now. And so that's why this compensatory gain can work to our advantage. The other thing these researchers discovered when they were going back through all the data is that typically whatever body condition score the heifer was her first year, she wouldn't start cycling in subsequent years until she reached that same body condition score. So if she was over conditioned her first year, there's a chance she's not even going to turn on cycling in time to get bred for her second calf. Um, we often say uh, reproduction is, is a luxury, and, and, and that's why, right? So um, just some things to, to kind of consider when you're looking at how to develop those heifers. Uh, that being said, there are a few boxes you have to check. So the lowest I'm willing to go at the time of breeding is about 55% of mature body weight. There's data out there showing you can do it at 50%. In Western Canada, if, if we have a really extreme weather event come along, I don't want to be too far behind, if that makes sense. So 55% is usually what I recommend as a minimum. And you really need that, that spring grass um, to act as your, to create your flushing effect. And so this works really well for those um, April, May, June calving herds. If you're trying to calve in January, February, and March, you're probably just not aligned with mother nature enough where you can take advantage of, you know, the flushing effect. So just something to keep in mind that this does work better for those true spring calving herd. Um, the other thing I recommend is if you're going to this, you really need to shorten up your breeding season. Like if you expose those girls for three cycles, you're undoing all your hard work because you're allowing them too many chances. So my absolute max is 42 days, but I highly recommend 30 days. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we can still achieve desirable conception rates in 30 days a little bit later. Um, a couple other things to keep in mind, um, you got to maintain a positive energy balance out through calving. That makes sense. And the first year you do this, you might want to keep back more heifers. So when we first tried this, I don't know, like eight, eight or nine years ago, um, we found out that our heifers maybe weren't as, as efficient as we thought they were. And we wound up with around 70% preg rates off two cycles. And so after selecting for this for a number of years, you can consistently get that 85% off two cycles. Um, but your first year um, might be a bit of an eye opener and, and that's to be expected. So let's fast forward now um, to the pre-breeding time period. I like to take a really hard look at heifers about six weeks before the bulls go out. So this is a good time to assess what percentage are cycling. So I should have around, you know, maybe 5% a day. If I don't have enough cycling or if my body condition um, is, is a little bit lower than what I'd like it to be, I still have time to correct that. I still have time to create a flushing effect, right? The six weeks prior to breeding is also the ideal time to vaccinate. So I um, recommend you visiting with your veterinarian to figure out what's the best option for you. Um, a common recommendation is to give a modified live vaccine with an FP label claim. So FP stands for fetal protection. This means that if a heifer or a cow comes in contact with a BVD virus, these vaccines are proven to prevent that gestating fetus from becoming persistently infected with BVD, which we all know can, um, can do... Um, a lot of damage in terms of, of health biosecurity for our herd. So um, talk with your vets. Um, modified lives with FP are, are probably a really good option. Six weeks before calving is an ideal time to give these because the first time those heifers see that vaccine, the IBR fragment can cause some temporary inflammation in the reproductive tract. So you can get a, a slight reduction in fertility for maybe one to one and a half cycles. 
So it's nothing, nothing to worry about in subsequent years after they've seen that vaccine once they, they should be fine. But this first year, if you can give it at least four weeks out, but ideally six weeks out, they'll be far past that inflammation But by the time the bull um, gets turned out. So, and then lastly, we're going to talk about some things you can do um, at the time of breeding. So, um, I want to share some really great research with you out of the university or, or the um, U.S. Meat Animal Research Center on the value of heifers that are set up to calve in the first cycle. So, um, they followed over 16,000 head of heifers for 21 years. <laughs> And those heifers were categorized based on if they calved in the first, second, or third cycle as a heifer. And then they kept track of how many came up open and, and left the herd. And so in the end, it turned out that if you were second or third cycle calving heifer, really didn't make much of a difference. You had about the same fallout over 10 calving seasons, but those heifers, that conceived and calved in the first cycle had a distinct advantage. So they stayed in the herd on average at least one year longer. So these girls weaned you one more calf before they came up open. Because they're calving earlier, they're also weaning you a bigger calf, right? 21 days times two pounds a day, that's 42 pounds. And so when they looked at these different groups of heifers in terms of their weaning weights, um, those first cycle pregnancies always weaned a heavier calf. And there was a statistical advantage all the way up to calf number six. So when you add up the additional weaning weight, it's almost as if these first cycle calving heifers give you the equivalent of a whole nother calf. Plus, they're staying in the herd a year longer. So just by either shortening up your breeding season or working with your veterinarian to retain heifers that were bred in the first cycle or um, at least the first 30 days, it's like you're getting two extra calves, which is huge when you consider most um, economists would suggest it takes at least five calves for a heifer to pay for her original development costs and then her ongoing maintenance costs. So two out of five, just by ensuring early pregnancies, it is, is a huge thing we can take advantage of. So I mentioned earlier, um, 42 days is my absolute max um, that I would ever recommend on exposing heifers. And I strongly encourage you to shorten that down to 30 days. So I know what you're thinking, like, I don't want to go 30 days uh, or, um, you know, just, um, just you know, one cycle or 30 days and not get the number of pregnancies that I need. But there are ways to get you two cycles worth of pregnancies um, in, in a 30 day period. So the most obvious would be to utilize some sort of extra synchronization protocol, right? So this would be um, probably the most popular protocol that um, we would use on heifers. But let's be honest, it's not always very practical, especially depending on where your heifers are pastured, to put those girls through a shoot four times. Um, there's a lot of labor associated with that. There's a, there's a lot of uh, expense associated with the materials, semen, and whatnot. Um, these work well in that everyone had their chance to get pregnant on day one, and you can leave a bull in for another three weeks and, you know, probably get your 85% in, in a very short period of time. Um, but if this doesn't sound appealing to you, there's still ways to capture the value. So I want to share with you uh, what we call the short cycle trick. The way this system works is the bulls go in uh, just as they normally would. And they're allowed to breed on natural heats for the first five days of the breeding season. During this time period, I would expect around, you know, 20 to 25% of heifers um, to come into heat and be bred. And then at the end of day five, every single heifer gets a shot of prostaglandin. So if you were bred in the first five days, this shot does absolutely nothing. 
It's like you didn't even get it. Um, if you were not bred in the first five days, you're likely at a point in your cycle where you have a structure called a corpus luteum on your ovary. This prostaglandin shot will lyse that corpus luteum and that sets off the cascade that leads to ovulation of another follicle. So those remaining 75, 80% of heifers, they're all gonna come into heat in the next four days. So by day nine, you've completed, everyone has had one chance and you would get the equivalent conception rate of, of one full cycle. And then you can leave the bull in an additional 21 days. That takes you out to day 30 and you should get 85% pregnant and you've only got to handle them once. So there's lots of variations with this. And I encourage you again to reach out to your veterinarian to talk about what might work really well with you. But this is a really great way to set those heifers up right, to build momentum in their, your herd, give them more time to rebreed for the next season and promote longevity. So if we were using some sort of um, reproductive strategy like the short cycle trick, and say uh, we originally turned those bulls out on July 1, and then we're done breeding by August 1. That means you can phone your veterinarian and book them for a preg check on September 1. And so this chart uh, depicts um, a market value for like eight, nine weight uh, grasser heifers. And so if we can find those opens on September 1, you can market those girls while you still have peak price because most of the opens aren't coming to town until, you know, October, November. And so this is a huge ad ad advantage. We can capitalize on our opens um, and we get very, we're selecting, we're allowing mother nature to select for very fertile, very efficient heifers that match our environment, that match our management. And so the way I encourage you to think about, you know, commercial replacement heifers um, is the same that you would think about a grass or operation, right? I want you to manage them in a very, um, uh, very economical fashion. And I want you to think of a pregnancy as a byproduct in an already profitable grass or operation. So if we're making money on our opens here, well, we sh should be doing awesome on, on our pregnancies, right? So just something to consider. Uh, so I know that's a lot of information. Um, some of the things I kind of want you to take away from this is the more you treat her like a cow, the better cow she is gonna be. It is not worth pampering her. It's not worth subsidizing her through that first calf just to find out that she's not going to be able to cut it later on. Get her gone now before you have all of those costs into her or before she depreciates as an open lactating two-year-old, right? And let mother nature help you find those fertile cows um, and those highly efficient cows. Uh, the other thing I strongly recommend that you do is limit your breeding season to 30 days. That's really going to help you build momentum, have a front end loaded calving season, get really good breed back rates. Um, that's going to have a lasting impact on longevity, as we've seen in, in the data. And if you can do those things, you're going to be profitable. So the last thing I'll leave you with, I guess, is a, is a picture of my most favorite cow of all time. Um, so she pretty much calved first cycle her entire life. She weaned 15 calves, um, and she made it just past her 18th birthday, uh, before we had to put her down, but she's got daughters, granddaughters, great granddaughters. I bet you 75% of the herd has her genetics in it. And I know there's research out there that says, you know, fertility is actually not that heritable, but I want you to look at those old girls in your herd and think about how when they calve early, what they're doing for the next generation. They're setting up that next heifer, right? Because she's gonna be older, more mature at breeding. She's more likely to catch first cycle. And so this is where you can really start to build that momentum and select for a very fertile, efficient cow herd. So um, I never really call, call cows just on age. Um, and. Uh, if they need to go to town, that's one thing, but 
uh, it just warms my heart when those girls come through uh, the shoot and they're pregnant. And so I, I just encourage you to kind of consider uh, the value that they can add to your herd. So that's it for me. I will stop sharing and we will turn it back over to Sydney. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was so great and some really important insights there. Um, we will hear from Elizabeth again in our Q&A session. But now I would like to invite Stephen Hughes to share his screen while I introduce him. Um, yeah, I think Elizabeth, you're gonna have to stop sharing for yeah. Stephen. Um, yeah, Stephen Hughes is a third generation rancher from the Eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains in Southern Alberta. He's an owner and operator of Chinook Ranch Limited near Longview, along with his partner, Georgina, his father, James, and his daughters, Kayla, Josie, and Aaron. Stephen has been an Environmental Stewardship Award winner from the Alberta Beef Producers, McDonald's flagship, Farmer for Canada, a longtime leader of the Longview 4-H Beef Club, and a previous mentor in the BCRC Beef Researcher Mentorship Program. So please join me in welcoming Stephen. Stephen's first challenge will be getting set up. He's been a big challenge that way. But I think we got it. Oh, sure. Doing this again, eh? Sydney, what did I do wrong? Nothing. You did everything right. I would just give it a second to load and then if you want to X out and try to do it again, it might speed it along. Okay, that worked. That's what it doesn't like is me trying to get it into the slideshow. Mm, frustrating. Sorry, Sid. Oh, no worries. It'll work. Okay, we just did this like half an hour ago and it worked. I promise. What do you want me to do? Uh, well, would you like me to share it on my end? Uh, if you can. Mm -hmm. Of course. Sorry. It's crazy. Pro. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. There you go. So that's you? Oh, no, that's you. That's all you. Oh, okay. Well then, uh, same title, same topic. Uh, I might start off um, probably sounding a, a little bit repetitive, um, piggybacking over top the message of, of um, that uh, Elizabeth was delivering. But having said that, <clears throat> It's funny, it's all, I, 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 I just, everything is just right where we wanna be. Uh, I'm just gonna tell you in a more uh, layman's terms, I think. And, uh, and uh, probably a little bit simpler and maybe a few things that we apply to our own operation, just out of logic, but Elizabeth gave us some uh, great facts there. Uh, I, I, like her, I'd like to thank BCRC for the opportunity to speak on this topic. I also, I would probably consider this one of my favorite topics in ranching. Um, our whole program, basically everything we do is designed around developing heifers, uh, developing cows that will work in our environment. And uh, again, the longevity piece for us is a big deal. Um, Sydney touched on a little bit. I'm, I'm an owner operator of Chinook Ranch. We're located just southwest of Longview, Alberta, uh, in the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. We're family owned and operated since the 1940s. And one of the cool things about building a cow herd, I think, uh, is back in, I think, the late 40s or around 1950, my grandfather sort of put together the last piece of land out of Pat Burns Estate Sales, the Bar U Ranch. And in that sale, he also purchased some shorthorn Hereford cross cows that you could actually never get him to admit he did in the rest of his life. But that herd, like, were how many years later? 80 
plus it, it's still like it, the cow herd has never been sold per se, like cleaned out and started over. So the art and the science of developing females, I find fascinating and good cows are something, you know, to behold and to talk about and to discuss and to admire. And there's, I've got, I've got some ideas I, I would like to hope will help you on your journey to try and if you're interested in building a cow herd like I am. Like one of my favorite things I do anymore is develop heifers for myself and heifers that were, I, I sell personally to other people. We usually do a private treaty at home and I get a lot of satisfaction out of the feedback and following up and talking to people about our cattle working in their program. And I, I love that part of this business. Um, similar to what Elizabeth had to say, I think a lot of this, but for us, we've been grazing year round now for 27 years up to 75 days ago we started 27 years ago but due to the drought this summer we put the cows on feed this fall um we'll touch on that a little bit too because we're still testing the cattle by feeding a lot of straw uh back then where to where are we somewhere in the 90s in the last century decided to take advantage of our unfair advantage which where we live is the being on the eastern slopes and it's in the name of the ranch. It's the Chinooks that help us keep the grasslands open in the winter. We probably, it's widely considered that bison came to these areas and the grass developed under dormant season grazing. So with that model in mind, we set out 27 years ago to graze all pregnant cattle year round. And it, it frankly never faltered till this fall. And everything we do, buying bulls, uh, everything along the way, every day probably, somehow, we're working on developing females that work for us. It's a, I'm not a patient person, and it's a patient person's game, because you only get a calf once a year, and it's a slow process building a cow herd, but I find that very satisfying. Uh, as I said, we focus on winter grazing, uh, protein sup with just minimal protein supplementation, depending on your uh, your age class of your cattle. We're not talking about that too much tonight, so we will gloss by it. Uh, pretty ideal cow for us. Lots of capacity. Uh, phenotypically, we certainly want heifers that exhibit this kind of phenotype with lots of depth. You know, structural strength. They got to have good legs and feet to climb up and down these hills. And they, and, and they just like, they just gotta be good doing cattle for lack of a more uh, scientific word. This fall, as I said, different game, but we've got like the mature cows on a 75% straw diet and uh, the rest is uh, high protein hay. Sort of the same concept, it's working. Um, again, it's all about efficient females that are ready to work for you. So similar to what Elizabeth said, with that in mind, when we're wintering our calves, uh, again, it's not, I would say they're not pampered, but certainly in our year round grazing program or in the way we winter our calves, it could sound like, you know, we're tough on them. I think we're tough, but fair. Uh, we have very balanced plans and rations and mineral program is top notch. And, uh, I think that's all key. Like their needs are met, but we're not overdoing it, right? And uh, similar to what Elizabeth was saying, same idea. We want to we want to grow heifers gently through the winter. She gave you all the technical reasons why it should be. I just started doing it. We used to feed our heifers in a in a feedlot pen at home. Uh, you know, bedded, fed way more, way better condition. Um, and just sort of probably at the same time that we started to start grazing cows year round. I, I too agree, grazing is a very learned behavior. Uh, part of that learning is your own mindset, trust me. And uh, so we like running the calves out and running them a little leaner. Our goal in the winter, as it says, is to grow frame on these calves not condition. Condition is just expensive for what we want to achieve. 
And two things that I think are really, really important uh, is two statements that to me make a ton of sense is let the cattle find their way and sort at the bottom, not the top. So let the cattle find their way. Elizabeth touched on it. Overconditioned cattle, cattle that are fed hard. How can you tell who the better doing heifers are? So I'd rather, and then the sort at the bottom, not the top. I don't worry about who the best heifers are at this stage. Like we're in January. If I go sort in March, May, I don't worry about who the best heifers are. I worry about sorting at the bottom. And by that, I mean, with our winter program being light, we get through to the spring. Uh, I go out there, we go out there, and we are looking at who's the, who's the cattle, just, just where we want them. I'm probably going to take out the great big growthy ones because that's kind of just by just getting out of our range of management. But I'm also going to now peel out the cattle that are just look tougher. Like they did winter as well. I've probably identified cattle that aren't, aren't as easy fleshing. So we just, they're out, they're out of the program, but I didn't worry about who's the best heifers yet. Right. Let them find out, let them find out themselves. We've got a lot of ways and technologies nowadays that we can identify cattle genomically. We can do all kinds of things, but this is very simple, very easy to do at home. Let the cattle sort themselves out. We actually keep, all our heifers now, um, except for the Wagyu's that uh, Georgina added to our program. Um, and those heifers go in the fall. I keep all the rest of our heifers. If there's a undervalued animal in the first place in the beef industry, it's a heifer at weaning. Like the spread, price spread from her to a steer is huge at that point. So if nothing else, I'd like to grow them out another year and use the the, the potentiatory grain gain on the grass to to put the weight on cheap at that point and it's just it's fabulous how you shrink that value gap from steers and probably with our kind of cattle it's more fair to the feedlot to buy these heifers that are grown out more properly and i'll quickly touch on another little you know we call it the purple tag program this is going on at birth and it's also very simple because we don't, we're range calving. Uh, I don't, we don't have the labor pool to worry about tagging everybody at birth. But it's very simple. We got a cow with qualitative traits or something that, you know, she's not cullable, but maybe we think she could be doing better. Like her udder is just not where it needs to be. Maybe she's got a bad foot, but you know, she can stay in business. Uh, we, we just put that purple tag in the, in the heifer's ear. If she has a heifer calf, purple tag goes in the ear. When we go to sort, doesn't matter what the calf looks like, we're not keeping it. Josie and I were both doing it last spring. Um, nobody questions anybody on it. If the purple tag goes in, it's out. The heifer's out. And that's just another way we're sorting at the bottom and we're just sorting against poor traits. And it's as simple as that. And uh, I love that we've kind of added that to our program because it's, it's brilliantly simple and, it, and it's effective because it just speeds up the growth we're making and delivering quality cattle. Uh, these are heifers, yearling heifers late spring. You can see their conditions picking up. Uh, as Elizabeth alluded to, you want them in rising plain and nutrition. That's all I ever talk about, rising plain and nutrition. Our whole program is based on a rising plain and nutrition when we're grazing cows year round, when we're wintering bulls, and when we are raising yearling heifers for breeding. It's all the same concept. They're rising. We don't breed till July 15th. I think peak grass protein where we live is considered to be July 21st. So it's just up, up, up all the way into breeding and it flushes cattle. I go back to the sentence, probably in the second slide. Timing is everything. I love this picture, not because it's a fantastic picture that I think Josie took of this calf is the grass. This is June. This is Canada. Grass has 90 days really to flourish. 60 days in reality on our native native grass. Use that. We're using that flush to our advantage. And so when the cattle need the most nutrition going, they're lactating, they're going into breeding. Here we are. We're in a rising plain. 
if you uh, take, as Elizabeth said, those over-conditioned heifers and turn them out on grass, they're just, they're literally going to crash and burn. Similar to a Dallas Cowboys playoff team. Sorry, is it too soon? Can't resist. You deserve it. Don't be a Cowboys fan. Now we've got the heifers through the winter. Now we're into July. Um, now we're getting to the point of why I'm even on this webinar, I think. I once was an actor in a supporting role in a commercial that was all centered around Ronald Bergen. And I saw a, uh, I saw a post that BCRC had put out about calving the heifers three weeks ahead of the cows. And I felt comfortable knowing Reynolds through this process to just call him and, and discuss it with him. And this is what's landed me in this position right now. So this, this, this webinar is about developing heifers, but my main point for uh, being on this call was, I said, I don't actually agree with calving heifers ahead of the cows uh, for a number of reasons, uh, as we can read here. Weather stress for starters, automatically, it doesn't really matter when you calve, but if you're going to calve three weeks sooner, you're probably increasing your chances of poor weather. We, as you can see here, even we get caught in bad storms, but I don't really want to find ways to try to make that happen more often. The second that cow calves, her protein and energy requirements have now basically doubled, and you have now got to feed that expensive feed three weeks longer. It's more labor to calve earlier and to calve longer. Uh, and then another key point, and Elizabeth was all over it really, when you talk about depreciation and everything, you're now asking that two-year-old who hasn't grown up yet to actually spend more days lactating than the mature cows in the herd. And so you've probably helped her get rebred that first year by giving her that extra three weeks. I think you're again, giving cattle you're almost making excuses for cattle that aren't, that are going to fall out anyways. So it's tough on them. Why are we making them lactate longer? So doubling down on Elizabeth's idea of breeding 30 days or less, that's what we do. We breed our cows 60 and we breed our heifers 30. And by breeding our heifers 30, I've accomplished the same thing as breeding three weeks ahead. I've, they're getting bred in the first cycle of the cow herd or they're not. And then, so you've cut it in half, you're still forcing the fertility to happen. Once again, now I am sorting from the bottom. Like you can't identify the best cattle by phenotype strictly. You can cut some out for poor phenotype, but that, that, that 30 days, like you're, you, you're cutting out the, the, the cattle that can't cut it in your management or my management situation. Um, and again, so we're breeding 30, July 15th, we're probably pulling the bulls, August 15th, Elizabeth talked about peak marketing. The day we pull the bulls, I booked the vet to come in 30 days. And we're prank checking at that point. Um, and you can, you can do, you do, we do very well selling open heifers. Like there's no shame in it. And the graph showed that is actually one of the best times to be shipping those heifers anyways is mid-September. Um, so I, I, I like making that yearling be bred half as long as she's going to be bred the rest of her life versus giving them that extra time and extra fee to get rebred. I think it actually is a better measure of fertility on those yearlings. I also like, I'm a big believer in uh, stacking successes and, and management decisions build on each other. And you make that decision to make that heifer lactate longer and she's probably pregnant that first fall but as a three-year-old she's open and you're like you know why is there so many three-year-olds open well it's probably because of the decision you made two years ago to actually breed those yearlings ahead of the cows and i i feel strongly about this i think there's a more logical approach a more animal welfare friendly approach by not calving earlier it's easier on people like maybe it's busy for three weeks but if you're calving, you're calving, and I'd rather, I'd rather, uh, I'd rather calve everybody at the same time, and then you're done. It doesn't drag it out over three months. Uh, just some pictures of us breeding. We do, we do do some synchronization, uh, same program. Elizabeth 
talked about, so I won't repeat it. Uh, we did a mixture last summer, actually, of just naturally bred for 30 days. We synced some heifers and AI them. And I think, like, all told, when we preg checked 166 heifers in September, we had 155 pregnant. Uh, it's a pretty successful way of doing things. And now this doesn't want to switch slides. There we go. Okay. Uh, Seems how we're talking about calving. I just put in some gratuitous calving photos. That's actually a two-year-old. We do calf two-year-olds in at home. I'm not brave enough to range calf two-year-olds. Everything else range calves. We calve our two-year-olds in a pretty large pasture and then move them out after 24 hours. But of course, you always get the early one that goes to the top of the hill at home and calves with a few. Luckily, the weather was good and it made for a nice photo. Uh, another... Calvin on the grass, calvin in sync with nature, timing is everything, no news there. I alluded earlier to the accumulative effect of layering and stacking sound management decisions for better way of putting it. Like I, I, it, 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 it's so key and I probably won't articulate it properly, but there's layers and layers like not overfeeding, having a sound vaccination program, a good general program, it, like your cow, you let your cow slip in November because you think she's only in her middle trimester. Uh, you let her get down in condition or you don't feed mineral. And then the next fall, your pregnancy rate is, is, is not as good as it used to be. And that the decision you made 10 months previous caused it. And those sound decisions, it's, it's neat. Like there's so many layers to, to building a good cow herd. Uh, I love this picture. Um, and not just because of the light from the smoke last summer. I don't love how pathetic our grass looks in the drought. Uh, but for, I'm not going to tell you what an ideal cow is, but a cow that works in your management paradigms and lasts, I'm more concerned about cows that last. I like the longevity piece. I like taking heifers off cows that are older. I love this cow. You know, she's moderate, she's feminine can't see it but she's got an absolutely perfect udder she's very tame and she's raising a, a good honest calf and I, I need my cows to raise good honest calves I don't need them to shoot the lights out I don't want a heifer that raises a calf that's 75 pounds heavier for two years and then she's dry and she's out uh, and I feel strongly about that as well because it is super expensive to replace replacing heifers replacing cows in your herd and the number one reason cattle fall out of herds is reproductive. I'm running up against my time limit. So I will thank Sydney for all her help trying to limp me through this. And I will thank Kayla Hughes for once again, helping me prepare my presentation as she always does. So uh, anyways, hopefully that gives you some things that you can find useful at home in more layman's terms. And uh, we will go to questions, I guess, at this point. So I got to stop sharing my screen, right, Sydney? Yeah, if you could stop sharing, that'd be great. But thank you so much. That was so great. I know we had a little bit of technical difficulties in the beginning, yeah. but yeah, you handled it. That's like pretty much my specialty. I really appreciate it. <laughs> stop. Yeah. At this point, uh, I will invite uh, Dr. Homorowski to turn her camera on as well and we'll jump into the Q&A. Um, we have gotten a few questions but as we go through I encourage the audience to ask more and um, yeah. So first um, we have a question that was covered a bit um, but what is the ideal weight for a first bred heifer? Steven, do you want what to know? stage? At what stage? When she's bred or mm -hmm. when she went to breeding? I would say to to be bred. Like at what weight? Well, but everybody's cattle are different, right? So I don't think mine are super heavy when we're breeding them. I'm probably closer to that 55%, but I wasn't aiming for it. It's just how our cattle end up. Um so we're like, I mean, there is no ideal. If your mature cow is fifteen hundred pounds and fifty-five percent of that is whatever that math works out to, right? Um, 
So for me, I think ours are running around 800 pounds when we're breeding. And we're selling open heifers in the ring, you know, 950 to 1,000 pounds typically. So there's no shame in that, and that's a great heifer to sell. And they're popular in September. I don't know if that, you know, that's a tough question to answer because every place is specific, right? That would be very similar to mine. I think the thing you'll find, because we've worked with a lot of herds for a long period of time, and the um, when you transition to some of these more extensive systems, your mature cow weight typically goes down a bit. Like those, like 17... 100 pound cows and up, they seem to not hang around. So you kind of tend to select against some of those bigger framed heifers, which Stephen alluded to, he's visually pulling out anyhow, because he knows they're not going to hang just because their maintenance costs are too high. So agree 100%. It depends um, on your breed, on your operation, time of year, all that stuff. But the more you, the closer you get to what Stephen's doing, you're probably going to have a more moderate cow. Thank you both. Um, next, we have another weight related question. So if you raise the heifer slower and breed at 55% of mature body weight, do you actually diminish mature body weight as a secondary impact? I think they still get there in the end. What do you think, Steve? Like they might take more time. Like my, my three-year-olds are are still a ways away from a mature cow weight. Um, yeah, I, th I think that goes to what I said. I don't think animal, like we're not, like diminished, no. Like they're not stunted. Our cattle are actually so framed out that they don't waste time on grass growing skeleton. Uh, and to hit a thousand pounds in September is pretty awesome off grass for, a, for an open heifer. So I think our, Mature weight has come down over time after 27 years of great grazing year round, but not a lot of weight, more frame and just cows that are tanky and lots of capacity. Like we don't necessarily lose the weight. We're probably selling 1350, 1375 pound dry cows. But you know, if you're in Northern Alberta, you're going to say my cows are tiny, but I wouldn't call them tiny. They're solid and they're, they've got jam to them, but I, I, we're not hurting them. Like we're not hurting them because they're so well developed, but it's just not excess fat. And that's that whole thing about keeping them rising. Thank you both. In my opinion. No, appreciate it. Um, moving on to our next question. We have, um, so it's a question regarding the effect of Multiman 90 on um, breeding up heifers um and what effect that has and i guess we could expand it into a larger um, trace mineral injection program or trace mineral supplementation if both of you could speak to that um yeah i guess my philosophy with cows heifers livestock in general is i give them exactly what they need when they need it nothing more nothing less and so those heifers they need minerals, vitamins on a daily basis. And I'd rather work with my nutritionist and put together a really great mineral, mineral package like Steven's done. Um, and so that we're fully utilizing that and getting our full value out of it. I don't want to have to go in later and give, you know, an injection to bring them up to speed. Um, uh, and it's, it's nothing against, you know, multi-men or anything. I just... I would rather feed it daily. Um, when you give a, a bigger dose at times too, if she can't utilize it all that day, it goes out the back end. So you might not always get your value out of some injectables as you would uh, your bioavailability sometimes on a daily mineral is a lot better. But Stephen can kind of talk about his mineral package and, and what they've tweaked in it um, to and how that's impacted fertility. Well, my nutritionist phoned me today and he said, no, no infomercials. <laughs> so he phoned to see if it was tonight and he was going to watch. So hopefully I'm not letting you down anymore. But no, I'm a big, I, I, again, like we don't, you know, I'd never do a vitamin ADE shot or selenium shot at birth and all that. I'm a big believer in feeding mineral. Like 
Our cows are left to their own devices a lot, especially in the winter. If there's somewhere I'll spend money, it's mineral and it's protein. And uh, we, I, I'm not supposed to do an infomercial. So I'm very happy with the mineral program we've been on about the last three, four years. And like our benchmark things that we can measure, big improvements and visually like the hair, like I, I love, like I, I'm a big believer in like, feeding mineral all the time i wouldn't understand doing a shot to catch up i don't like i think that's super important that's that's why we're supposed to take our vitamins i i might get in trouble from georgina once in a while for taking better care of my cattle than i take care of myself <laughs> so I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I'm a big, and I think this is part of the layering good management decisions, like keeping that mineral and I'm keeping that fetus healthy. You can impact that fetus by shortening it on mineral. You might impact its reproductive ability 10 years down the road. Like I'm seeing, like the guy I mentored in BCRC taught me that like fetal health is such a big deal. You short them now, you will not be as reproductively sound later. And that's the calf you don't even see. So I'm a big believer in a good mineral program. Thank you both. All right, moving on to the next question. We have um, a question about the average mean winter temperatures in Alberta. Um, this asker of a question is worried um, about grazing replacement heifers in Manitoba winters due to the extremely low temperatures and then um, typical slow, snow loads. So could either of you speak to that? Um, probably not. I mean, we could we could look up mean temperatures. <laughs> I'm afraid to just give you a number and be wrong because I'm not even, I'm, I'm American, so like, I'm not even fully acclimated to winter up here still, I guess. But um, it's really more um, keeping them out of the wind, keeping them dry. And they can tolerate the cold temperatures. But if you're in a really high humidity, high moisture area, then I then I am um, worried. Also, if you get like the crust on the top layer of your snow, that can definitely uh, be a little bit challenging to, to graze. Um, so, but I'm not worried about even last week. Um, our cows were out there. We turn, turned them into their new field pasture and they went to picking like it. Even the negative 40 doesn't, doesn't phase them if you can keep them out of the wind and you can keep them dry. Stephen, would you like to add anything or? Well, I mean, that's just it. And I wouldn't purport to be an expert on someone's management in Manitoba, but the whole principle around windbreak and yeah, cattle are, I said something about your own mindset, which will be part of the training. Cattle are tougher than you want, sometimes tend to give them credit for. Uh, if they've got capacity and they can fill up with roughage and they can stay warm, cows like to go grazing. They like it. And uh, like, I'm not answering the question properly, but it, 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 it's your management and your situation. There's still, I think some of the principles that I came to the table with today still apply. I don't, I'm not sure it matters where you are. And it's just good husbandry. Okay. Moving on to something a little bit different. Um, there's a question regarding how long the interval should be between calving and rebreeding with heifers that I guess, yeah, specifically heifers. Well, if we've got them bred in the first 30 days, then they're basically going to calve in the first 45 days of calving and your very latest heifer is still 45 days away from the bulls going out and the you know the early ones i mean that's just i say 45 days but we essentially we come in around 35 probably calving our heifers uh, but the interval is going to always be the same unless you're changing your calving right but you're giving her a better chance like what i like is about the shorter breeding but not worrying about being ahead, you still got them in that first cycle. And that's what's key. The more cattle in the first cycle, the better. And then they've got that time to recover and, and get rebred. You've given them a great start. Elizabeth would speak to it better than me, but that, uh, 
that's how I would answer that question. Yeah, I agree. Um, we do calve heifers just a, a little bit ahead of cows for other reasons, but we're like one week. That that's it. Um, I don't I don't go way out and allow a lot of extra time if they can't make it in our system, then they can't make it. I'm not going to subsidize them. So. Thank you both. Um, the next questions are about the short cycle system. Um, so, uh, and, and specifically in regards to the bull heifer ratio, as you mentioned, Elizabeth, you suggested running a lower bull ratio in those 30 days. So what would those recommended ratios be? Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think you have to run less bulls. I usually run about the same number of bulls, but the bull can make a difference because we're talking, you know, usually if we're talking heifers, we're sometimes dealing with smaller groups. And so, um, I mean, if you have two yearlings out there and they just can't figure it out that they get everybody and they fall in love with one and, you know, you can get yourself in trouble. So, whereas if you've got a mature out there, you could have a mature with maybe, you know, 35, 40 head and he makes the rounds and get it all done. So when you're doing this system, even though you're not putting them through the shoot four times, you need to be out there every day watching what's going on. And if those bulls are not making the rounds, then you got to figure out a way to intervene and make sure you're not missing uh, heats. So um, I don't use less bulls. You could argue maybe you need more bulls, but typically because there's so much activity in the first nine days, cattle don't seem to uh, stray quite as far um, in, in the pasture. They kind of all tend to stick around the water um, and get a piece of the action. So a lot of times like we would use the same number of bulls we would if we weren't doing this at all. So. And on, if I can add to that, if that's okay. Um, I probably agree with pretty much 199% of what Elizabeth said, but I would be scared to death to sink my heifers and leave it to the bulls, which is why the ones we sink, we AI. And so again, we're out there, we're on it. And then, then we have cleanup bulls for that three weeks after. And this year, like I said, I divided it up. We sink some and we left some with bulls because I'm like, these heifer bulls cost a lot of money. So some heifers got 30 days, period. Some heifers did get two tries in 30 days, but it scares me in the heat and everything else. And uh, to have, a like if we would have synced like 166 heifers, I think we only had six bulls. I like I I'm scared to see what would happen, but we're we're doing that same program, but we're AI in when after they're synced, and then and then we go with the bulls. And I don't go with less bulls either than I normally would have, because when they come back off that shot, anybody that missed is coming back in a week too. So that's a busy week as well. And I still we put all that work into them all year round. I don't want to. I don't want to fall down now by not having enough bull power, right? I think if you have a big group like Stephen, maybe you can. Um, sorry, if if you have a big group like Stephen, maybe consider staggering them, right, and not doing the shot all on the same day for everybody, right? There's a lot of ways you could tweak this and and make it work in your management style. Both. Um. We have a couple clarification questions, Stephen, regarding when you said you wean your heifers and Elizabeth, if you want to share when you, you wean yours as well. I, I wean my heifers the same time as the cows, but I'm saying, I was saying, if you bred your heifers earlier than your cows, you're actually asking them to lactate longer than their older counterparts, which draws them down, gets them in poor condition for their next, their first, their winter after weaning their first calf. And again, that layering now as a three-year-old having her second calf, she's down in condition because she worked harder last summer. Oh, my three-year-olds are 15% open. Well, that's why you made them work too hard. Like you made them work harder than the old mature cows. So I wean heifers the exact same time as our cows. 
And I mean, weaning to me in the drought this summer, we early weaned as one of the means of uh, managing body condition and grass demand was we weaned, right? It's one of the best strategies in drought is to early wean. But everybody gets done the same day. I don't, I don't, yeah, that's simple as that answer is for me. Um, same here, airbase wean, same day. Um, whether you're a steer to a heifer, steer to a cow, our weaning date changes, just like Stephen said, based on what the grass looks like. So steers came off a month and a half early this year. Um, I try to keep heifers on until that first snowstorm, but we didn't, we didn't get snow this year. So they came off, um, but um, we'll try to influence some of that behavior later. But it just depends what grass is looking like, what markets look like, if we sold online or if we're going to direct or auction or whatever, we're evaluating every year and seeing what's the best. We'll never just pick a date and say, all right, it's November 14th, it's weaning day. No, it changes every year. Thank you both. Um, I just want to check in with you guys and see if that we're okay on time, if you guys are still willing to answer a few more questions or? I'm fine. Okay, sounds good. I won't keep you all night, but uh, probably two or three more, if that's If right. there's questions, it's encouraging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few. So I'm just, <laughs> um, okay. Um, I would be interested in both of your guys' thoughts on this one. Um, this audience member is wondering what your thoughts are on um, a 30 day breeding period for heifers, but do it the second half of the 60 day cow breeding season. So have your cow herd start to calve and then do your heifer herd for the last 30 days or for that first cycle? It's, it, I find that question fascinating because I literally thought of that today or yesterday, one of the two. And I mean, there's the idea that the closer you calf to the longest day of the year, the more quickly they return to asterisk. But if the goal is to keep the heifers in the first cycle of your herd, I mean, you're really challenging yourself by calving them later. So, I mean, they're growing up, they're, they're having their first calf, they're still not a mature cow. It's kind of a great discussion point, but I certainly probably wouldn't go there just because you're not giving her, and you're not giving her enough time to, it's a fascinating question. I love the question. And it, but I think you're not giving her enough time just to get back, like to stay in sync with the herd. The whole goal is, high percentage bred in the first cycle and you just took that whole age group and put it in the second cycle so i love the question but that's why i wouldn't do it it shows some thinking though yeah i agree i just i think you're she'll be behind the eight ball at that point so thank you both um we have a few questions coming up regarding selecting heifer bulls and what you both feel um, is what the most important thing is when you're looking at selecting a heifer bull and then some of the things that you guys consider when you're making that decision. Um, on, the, on the genotype, the data side, I think one of the things you need to look at are calving these EPDs. So when I was a kid, we just looked at raw birth weight and then Turns out that's not a very good indicator of calving ease, especially when you find out that a bull you buy was an 80 pound twin. Well, he throws in some pretty big calves later on. So if you look at calving ease EPD, it takes into consideration whatever his birth weight EPD is, which is a amalgamation of his, you know, sire, dam, uh, grandsire, all of that, uh, siblings, um, and will get you a more accurate number. Um, but it also takes in the factor it um, considers um, uh, gestation length. So a lot of times these calving, these really heavy bred calving knees bulls are shorter gestation because those calves are gaining a pound, pound and a half at the end of gestation. So if you drop a calf a week earlier um, because your gestation is shorter, well then 
you're you're smaller, right? And so there's a lot of things to kind of consider there. I do think you can get too extreme in, in it though. Like if you breed heavy Cavernese heifer to a heavy Cavernese bull, I do get worried that you could have a slightly premature calf. So uh, more is not better in this, but I would say on the, on the data side, uh, that's probably the most important thing I look at. And then maybe Steven can kind of talk about uh, phenotype and some of the other things he looks for. Well, I'm going to be repetitive to start with because that's the first thing I would have said. That's a really big deal. Like if I use EPDs, I use them on birth weight because uh, a low birth weight bowl out of a power line, that's just a fluky low birth weight. It's not a heifer bowl. He's not going to be a heifer bowl. I look for, you know, a little bit of layering there too. Uh, the, gene, the genotype, the pedigree on that does matter to me. And then structurally phenotype, I mean, you can almost look at a bull and tell he's a heifer bull, right? His shoulders are right. I mean, I can, and I believe in it. Like his shoulders are right. He's smooth, you know, the way he's built. And like, if he's got bone like flexy, he's probably not a heifer bull, right? But again, I'm with you. Like I don't, we err on the side of caution to make sure our heifers calve easily because we sell a lot to other people, but I also want to have them perform. So it's a delicate balance. Uh, but I look for that lineage that it's not a fluke. The EPDs will indicate to you if it's a fluke, Cavanese and birth weight, uh, a fluky low birth weight. Uh, I, I still look at the birth weight. Then I look at the structure, you know, his head, is he smooth into the shoulders? Is he not too much bone? You know, you can tell a bull that's just big and soggy versus a bull that just looks like he's going to calve easy enough. And that's part of, what, being a cattleman, like you, you should be able to see that with your eye to a certain degree. And then have heifers, like our heifers walk a lot, so they're in shape. And and this is another thing I like about AI, and we can access some really nice heifer bull genetics and that are nice maternal cattle, like make nice heifers. They're actually pretty high dollar cattle and that you can get yourself in trouble there because just because they're expensive doesn't make them awesome. But we can access some really nice genetics to breed our heifers to that calve nice and produce a good calf. That's that's why I love AI and yearlings. So uh, and I, hopefully that answered somewhat the question. I guess there's a couple of other things that it, uh, didn't come to mind at first, but I'm not afraid to use a hybrid bull on um, on a heifer. Um, I think you can capitalize on a, on a lot there. Um, and there's ways to kind of figure out what their EPDs would, would be. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, a lot of times I'll look at age, the dam's age of that bull. And so my favorite thing to do when I get bull catalogs is I go through and I find out whoever had the oldest mom. And, um, if there's a bull in there with like a 12 year old cow, I'm that's the one I'm probably going to go check out first. Um, Cause again, like I'm, I'm selecting for a highly maternal herd and longevity means a lot to me. Um, so, but if I were selling all the calves off the cow and I wasn't selling bred heifers, well then, you know, I'd probably uh, really want a hybrid bull. Um, and I'd probably try for a, a, just a touch more performance than I would. in and if I'm keeping heifers, so. Thank you both. Those are, yeah, really great insights. Really appreciate that. Um, yeah, we've gotten a couple questions about managing first calvers throughout their first lactation um, and what you were, both of your thoughts are on keeping them with the main herd and allowing them to compete or to keep them in a separate um, pasture. I cab two-year-olds separately they go out on pasture after 24 hours and they stay separate till about the 1st of June. And then they go out into mature cow herds for, well, for good. Uh, and we split them based on our two breeding herds and the heifers go into one or the other, but I keep them separate because they, I supplement them with quite a bit more protein, right? Up till green grass. than I do the mature cows. In fact, the mature cows who may aren't getting anything, and the first cavern are getting that 
they're, we're trying to get a pound of crude protein in them a day and then they're grazing, but they need that help. Like they need that help. They're, they're still young and starting out and they haven't grown up. And for all those reasons, I'm going to take care of them at that point, but I wouldn't say that's excruciatingly pampering them. It's just good supplementation practice and it helps them get started. I think if I left them alone all summer in their own herd, they probably would do a little bit better condition wise, but we're not about running lots of herds, like lots of herds. Like I only got to talk about the one subject today because bulls for one, I was like, God, we're talking about this and we're not talking about bulls. So I'm glad somebody asked and the, the efficiency of your efficiency just goes down the more herds you have. So, you know, away they go, they go in the herd, they're in a rotational grazing system and they do okay. They do okay. Thanks. Um, we have a question about genomics. Um, and if you guys could speak to how you utilize this technology on your specific operations or potential opportunities um, to utilize this technology. Steven, you've been using it some, haven't you? I'm gonna say, well, we DNA'd all our spears last fall and went in a feedlot, but for a different project, genomics, I mean, great technology. Uh, I'm still old school enough that I'm letting the cattle sort themselves out. But, you know, if you could find the, the identify cattle genomically that are going to be easier doing cattle or more fertile or more efficient, like with a grow safe system and things like that, more power to you. I'm doing it our way and our environment and our management and letting, I'd like to, I'd like to say that the cattle are in a sieve and the poorer ones just keep falling out going through it and I, I'm going to make some people mad, but I don't think there's much replacement for that, but it makes me a dinosaur, but there's great opportunity in genomics to me right now. To, I've done, we punched ears on calves more than once because someone else paid for it. I find it pretty cost prohibitive at this point, but I know there's people out there smarter than me with very much disagree with, me saying that and that's fair um i mean i think you do what works for you right um we could have a the next webinar could be genomics <laughs> you could have people who are far better experts on it than us but it's come a long way i think there is a place for it but maybe like what Stephen alludes to is um especially if you can get into one of these trials where they cover the cost of it we'll then use it to sort out the bottom end Right. Like I'm never going to use it to rank my top heifers because I'm going to give everybody that's doing a decent job a chance with the bull. And if they come up open, well, then then they're out. Um, but I guess that's a whole nother discussion. If you want to use it selecting your opens or do you want to use it to select them? You know, after the bread, um, there's lots of opportunity there. And now there's. You can use them on crossbred cattle. So there was a while where there was a time when it was like each breed was its own language and you couldn't, if you had a, a hybrid, it, you know, you didn't always get reliable results, but that's come a long way. And I think there will be a place for it at some point in time, um, but it has to be used in conjunction with phenotype, mother nature, all these other selection pressures. Um, that will get you a heifer that fits your environment. Thank you both. Um, we have a question and it's, um, it's one that I believe even research is still trying to figure out and everyone has their own methods to their madness to get it figured out. But how do you effectively deliver consistent mineral to cows during extended grazing or on pasture? I do rubber tubs at UFA and I stay very <laughs> consistent. I mean, it's just free choice because we're not able to put it in a TMR because we're grazing or we're rolling out bales or flaking off squares. But I'm diligent about, say, this cow herd to get 103 grams a head a day in it 
in them. They're this many bags and clockwork. We put it out and I just trust it's palatable enough. I don't, you know, if it wasn't getting consumed by everybody, I think we'd see problems show up somewhere else and it's not. And we're very, very steady with delivery. And I don't put out enough for 10 days. I'll put out enough for four days. Right. And then it's coming at them more often and lots of tubs. And I, that's a TMR. There's no better way, but we don't have TMRs. So that's, that's how we deliver it. Simple as that. And you put the tub, we graze when we're moving in June, we're moving every two to five days, one to four days. Uh, tubs are light they throw in the back of the gator you throw in the mineral bags you move to the next field you move your electric fence you put out the tubs i don't know i don't know how else to do it it's simpler do you have anything to add elizabeth or um no there, i think steven said it very well um the biggest thing is just monitoring intakes and if they're not consuming it get a hold of your nutritionist and figure out if you can alter salt content or whatever to try to drive or move it around, put it by the water, put it far from the water, figure out what, what gets you the intake that you need based on your calculations. Okay. Um, I will ask you guys one final question and then I will let you go for the evening. Um, but because you both speak about the importance of longevity in your herd, um, we have a, actually two prompt question. So what is the average age of your cow herd? Um, and do you ever sell bred cows at all? Do you want to I go first? To, I, I need to send a five, a five alarm call to Tommy Ware at, at veterinary <laughs> health services to look at my herd tracks and tell me <laughs> average cow age. Cause I don't know. I don't um, honestly know. But, and the second part of the question was, sorry. Um, do you ever sell bread cows? I don't actually, but she, like, I figure if she's a call out of my place, I, yeah, I don't care if she's pregnant. I'm not selling that to somebody else because my name is on it. We sell lots of bread heifers, but I won't sell. And typically we're trying to hang on to these cows as long as we can. Like Elizabeth said, I understand. I understand completely that depreciation graph, but. Longevity is so key. I do the same thing. I look for the cows that are the oldest mums of bulls in a catalog. That's where I start. Longevity to me is so key. It's so expensive to replace a cow that falls out. It's very expensive. It's very, it's two and a half years of input uh, to get that money back. Um, so the average age of my herd, I mean, right now I feel like our herd is pretty young and pretty strong, but I do completely be guessing. I mean, I should know that, but I don't. I think we could actually tell you if we looked at her tracks, but we're not gonna do that right now. I apologize, I don't know either, Stephen. <laughs> but um, uh, we're in a building phase right now, so we've got a pretty young herd. And then we actually, so we typically don't sell cows. We sell bred heifers every year. Uh, but we just sold a, a bunch um, for drought management for next year. So we're always thinking, you know, six months, a year ahead. So we did actually sell some this year. Uh, I don't know what they'd be. Um, but yeah, like that one girl made it to 18 and there's plenty that made it, you know, 15, 16. Like that's not unusual. And I'll never call just for age. Like if they, if they're losing condition and I don't think they can winter well, well then they can go, or maybe they can go in with the heifers, uh, be fed over the winter. So they get a little bit, a little bit extra or something, uh, less competition maybe, but, um, yeah, I wouldn't call just for age. And we do, which it's not meant to be contradictory, but I sort of had targeted 14 years old. We sort of just tend to start calling them then because it, just with that, trying to ask them to winter graze, I just find they it's hard on them. And they generally fail somewhere in that next year because of it. It's weird, but we, ha we have started making 
the soft hearted decision to take some of those because they've just been such a good cow. We move them down in age class. So they run with the bread heifers and they get fed a little better. And maybe we keep them one more year, but I, I definitely 15 is my top. And I had, I don't know why I just was finding 14 years old after that. It was just, you want to sell a cow too as a call before it's a wreck. Like you always want to be a year early than way too late so that's my strategy and it's based on the fact that like they are winter grazing and you gotta walk and you gotta climb hills and so i do but it's not meant to be contradictory to your your theory at all the cow will tell you when it's time to go like yeah. you'll know or your vet will be like she's pregnant but i think we should shiver so yeah 